Good morning, everyone. My name is Grover Fowles, and I'm the president of Harrisburg School, and I would like to welcome everyone here uh, for this occasion. I would also like to thank uh, my officers, Mr. Alfonso Moore, our treasurer, Ms. Jan Fountain, our secretary, Mr. John Moore, a member and an alumni. Of course, Mr. Moore is also an alumni here at uh, Harrisburg School. So we welcome you here. And just for a moment, I want to give thanks, uh, a little devotion for the Lord who brought us here this far. And that uh, hopefully that he brought us here this far and that he'll take us home. Yes. And that we know that we're not in charge of this. He's always been in charge and always will be. So let us give thanks to him who has brought this food. Yes. And we want to bless this food that we have here that for the nourishment of our bodies and to also give thanks. Yes. Amen. 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 Now, Mr. Dr. Zavala, are you ready? You didn't come here to hear me. You didn't come to show. <laughs> Dr. Zavala. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, good. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Mr. Fountain. He's been trying to grab me to come out here for, for a while now <laughs> to train the phone calls and messages and stuff. It's, uh, it's my pleasure to do this. Uh, first of all, I want to say it's an honor to be in this building. Um, I've been at Tuskegee almost 35 years now. And a while back I started doing some history work with uh, Booker T. Washington and history of Tuskegee. And it didn't take long to get to this building. Because like, I drive around the communities a lot, and I said, this is an interesting building. And then I was going through some of the old newspapers, and had a picture of this building with the students in front. And I went to the archives and got some information. Then I went to Hampton Institute, because that's where Harris Barrett was from. And he was the treasurer of the organization, the Southern Improvement Company, that then created um, the school, and you know the, the, the land was, was called the Southern Improvement Company or the 40s, became Harris Ferret and then also Big Hungry. So uh, just all the generations that have come into this building, it's just it's one of those overwhelming things. So thank you for letting me present it here as well. Um, I do want to introduce uh, a couple of our PhD students. We have a PhD program at Tuskegee dealing with policy. Um, we have Jasmine Ratliff and uh, we have Monye Tavern. Tavern. Mm -hmm. And so they're, they're here. They can come. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> We're doing some land work at Tuskegee right now, trying to get all, our, all the land that the university owns throughout the county um, cataloged and listed and everything. Because land is important, right? Mm -hmm. you're not making, he always says you're not making any more of it. But sometimes how we protect the land is, is as important as getting the land. And part of that is what we call heirs property or air property. And so I've been going around, do you want to see this okay? Mm -hmm. So I've been going around doing some, some presentations and you know, I've, I've been talking about air property basically almost since I came to Tuskegee. And I think, well, that's the last one I'll have to do. And then, nope, there's always more. There's always one last question, one last thing to, to, to go over, and that's fine. Because if I can get one more person so that they have a little better understanding of their land and what it means and how to protect it, then that's, that's uh, worthwhile. So, um, the situation, why are we worried about land? Okay, specifically black owned lands, right? And then I have this graph here. Um, this shows, and this is just agricultural land, okay? Land that's been in farms. But there's also land that's in cities and in towns and so on. But from you know, this historic 1910 uh, census where there was about 16 million acres and 2017, you know, it's a little bit under 4 million acres. So a decline of three quarters, right? And then in Alabama, a little bit more than three, three quarters of land. That land's gone. Okay, it used to be farms and so on. It's out. And so what happens to that land? 
and wasn't able, you know, were people able to hold on to it? And that's what we're going to talk about a little bit today. So to do that, I want to have a little bit of perspective. And, you know, perspective means, you know, to get a clear view at something. So anyway, it's been many years now. I was driving through one of the rural counties. I was taking care of a house for a friend. And I passed by this, this scene. I thought, you know, how you drive by and it just catches the corner of your eye, right? And it was this. I said, what is it? Just... So I thought, well, I went to the house, and I came around, and came in a little bit better view. You can, you can almost see what that is, right? And almost a little bit better view, and then finally, I saw this man with the plow, right? You don't see that too often nowadays, right? And so he was going back and forth with his mule, or his horse, back and forth. So I happened to have my camera in my car, so I, I got it and I walked up to the fence and he stopped and I said, you know, do you mind if I take your picture? And he looked at me and he said no, but he's thinking, that's a cool thing to do. Why don't you get behind this mule and do something useful? <laughs> <laughs> so don't take my picture, take the horse. You know? <laughs> so anyway, he was out there and doing that. Today we're talking about air property, okay? And air property occurs when someone dies without a will. And they're descendants of that person, and they inherit the land. But basically what they're doing is they inherit the land without title. All right? They inherit the land without title. Which means that they don't own acres, they own interest. Okay? They don't own acres, but they own interest. And what also happens is you then own interest with all the other people who are then related to the person who has just died. Okay? So, you know, it could be children, it could be cousins, second cousins, brothers, sisters, grandkids, all are in the mix now. It's not just one person, it's in the mix. And I'm going to show this, and you can't really read it, but this is, Alabama said, that this is the way Alabama decides who is an heir to a particular person's land. Because when you die without a will, you are telling the state of Alabama that you want them to decide who has interest in your land. Okay? That is, you say, I don't want to deal with, you know, willing it to specific people. I'm going to let the state of Alabama do it. A lot of people don't, understand, don't realize that. And frankly, I don't like Alabama deal, <laughs> dealing with a lot of my stuff as it is. But how they determine who inherits my stuff is definitely not one of them. But Alabama has a way of determining that. Okay? Now, one of the reasons, or one of the important aspects of air property is that it leads to land loss. And that's because people don't know that they own a piece of land, that they've inherited a piece of land, that or they inherited an interest in that land. And because they don't know that they have an interest in that land, it also means that they have certain responsibilities to that land. And one of, you know, one of the most, uh, uh, the largest responsibility of land, right, is taxes. Right? Someone's got to pay the taxes. Right? So, um, so when you have heirs, or they're called co-tenants in common. A lot of times, heirs don't live near the land, they don't live near each other, they don't know one another, they don't know how to locate each other, they don't have a connection to the land. Like, how many kids, you know, we could say Macon County, they grew up and left. Now, you might say some left Macon County, went to Montgomery, 
happens, right? Some went to Atlanta, okay? Well, some went to D.C., New York, Boston. Some went to Chicago, L.A. And how often do they check back home to say, oh, you know, Uncle so-and-so died and you're one of their heirs, right? And I could, I'll, we'll talk about those kinds of owners or co-tenants in just a little bit. But because heirs don't know each other, they don't know how to get together to effect a way of planning for the land to keep the land the same in the family, to make it usable. That's another thing, right? It's nice to have land, but isn't it nicer to make money off the land? Land is an investment. I mean, you could lease the land and have somebody farm it, and then they give you some income. Or you could put some trees on the land, and in 20 years, you could harvest those trees. And, you know, a lot of college education was paid by trees. Okay? But when you have air property, you don't manage the land. Sometimes you don't manage the land quite as well because you don't even know you're supposed to be doing it. And this talks about that land, you know, has to be properly managed. So I'll just take the, the, the example of, of trees. So you know, a lot of times you say, oh, we'll just put some trees on the land and. and 20 years we'll harvest it. Well, to get a good harvest, the land has to be managed well. You have to thin the trees so they can grow well. You have to you know, scout it, make sure that the trees are healthy, you don't have pine bark beetle and all that kind of stuff. And then it comes time to harvest. For that harvest to be legal, that is for the logger to come in, that logger has to get the approval of all the heirs. Okay? If there are two heirs, he needs two signatures. Five heirs, five signatures. Ten heirs, ten signatures. Now, I'm not going to ask who has heir property here, but a lot of times there's a person who lives near the land, and that person will contact the logger and say, cut down the trees. Don't worry about the other folks. They said it's okay. It's not okay. But they do it. Now, for that logger to come in and do that without getting all those signatures, he's taking a risk. Because right? he's not following the law. And if he's taking a risk, you think he's just going to charge your regular price? No. He's going to charge kind of a risk fee. Because if he gets caught, he can have his license change. So now, the person who owns the land is paying more to get it, which means that you're getting less, you know, at the end of the day. Now, on top of that, ideally, all the heirs should get a percent of that money, right? So if you own 10% of the land, then you should get 10% of that money. And I know a lot of stories about people who say, I never got any money from cutting down the timber. Okay. So that's where the management comes in. Anything that goes on on that land, whether it's an expense or revenue generating, should be divided up, divided up among the heirs. Now, I'll, I'll mention this later on, but taxes. I've mentioned taxes before. Always ask, people always ask the question, well, I pay the taxes, so I have more rights to the land. Now, you might get a closer seat to God in heaven <laughs> for doing that. But on this earth, no. Now, what you should be doing is having all the heirs put in based on what their interest is. If you have 10% interest, they should pay 10% of the taxes. Now, I guess I don't think I mentioned this uh, to, to, to be real clear because I'm saying interest in land. So, for example, if you have 100 acres of land and you have 10 children and the, and the owner dies without a will, each child does not get 10 acres. They get 
a 10% share of that land. They have to get a 10% share. And you can say, well, what, what part of the land is that 10%? It's any place you want. It's 10% here, it's 10% there, it's 10%. There is no, because that's what would mean. You are a tenant in common. You own everything together. That's the 10%. And that's why you have to have everyone agree to do anything on the land. Because if you did something that a relative didn't want you to do, then wait, that's on my 10%. Because there is no deed that says your 10% is this piece of land here. Alright, so, I talked about heirs only a percent. So I'm going to give a couple examples. All right. So, uh, got a phone call. We get phone calls periodically about people who have questions about your property. And the first thing I tell them is, I am not an attorney. Okay? I cannot, you know, whatever I tell you is for information only. And you take it for what it's worth, and then you take it to an attorney. Okay, so I'm not practicing law, I can just give out information. So I get, I get a phone call, this woman says, um, my husband owns 52.4 acres of land in Lincoln County. I said, well, congratulations. Said, well, actually, it's air property. I said, okay. He said, and he owns it with a brother. Okay. So you got two brothers, and so they own 50%, 50%. And I just put down, you know, 26.3 acres. That's what the acreage would be. But they own 50% interest in that 54 acres. And I said, so do they get along? He said, yeah. But what they want to do is eat it off. So that one brother has 52 acres, I mean, 26 acres. The other brother has 26 acres. Smart. Yeah, it's a good thing to do. So there's no other no other brothers. No, no. I said, well, that seems pretty easy. Said, well, there was another brother. Oh. So <coughs> that means now three brothers, they each own a third interest in this land. A third would translate to 17 and a half acres. So I said, okay, well let's, do they get along? Well, that brother's dead. Oh, okay, now we're back to 52 acres. So I've okay, got an interesting sideline, but okay. In fact, I said, well, did they have any children? Did that other, does your husband have, you and your husband have children? No. Does the other brother have children? Which doesn't really make any difference because you can't have heirs until you pass on. So what about that brother who died? Did they have children? And I said, I don't know. Ah, uh, that's the trick. Because depending upon how many children will depend, they'll say how much each of those children will get in that land. Okay? So if he has two children, then he gets a 17.5 divided by two. Three children, 17.5 <coughs> divided by three. And it doesn't affect these two. But it has. But you see, it's not that they have this 17.5 acres, they have the whole 54 acres and they get a like a little slice of that in terms of interest. So I said, well, you're going to have to find out if they have any children. So, okay, we can do that. So I said, so your husband has the deed to the land that came from his father. Well, it was your property then. Oh, now that's different. Because they know that there were three brothers, but 
Were there any other children? And to be an heir, you don't have to be a, how do we call it, a traditional child. Sometimes there are some outside children involved. They have as much right as an heir to the land as from the mother and father. So, depending upon how many heirs were back here, they could have anywhere from one, and I just put one acre, if there were a lot, it could be less than an acre, or just the two of them, 26, at 50% or 26. So, that's, things got complicated kind of quickly on a piece of 52, uh, 52 acres. Because it gets complicated, that's where things can, can go awry and you can lose some land. Now, uh, I ran across a, another case to show how this could really, really, really go up. And uh, that person's family, the family the person is here, but this is a really good example, okay? I'm just going to call this the Johnson Estate. And Mr. Johnson lived from 1862 to 1939. And during his lifetime, he purchased three parcels of land. 63 acres, 80 acres, 34 acres. Okay? Which is quite a feat. I mean, this is quite a feat. And he had eight children, and he died without a will, what we call intestate. So I said, okay. The thing is, this Mr. Johnson is the great grandfather of the person who's living today. So, Mr. Johnson had eight children. Now, one of those children had 13 children, okay? Now, each of those eight children had 13 children. That meant that there were 104 heirs. Now, the one child that had the uh, 13, one of those 13 had nine children. <laughs> so, if that 104 had also nine children each, that's 936 children. And then one of those children from that nine that's here has had two children. And if all those heirs had two children, that's 1,872 heirs. For those three parcels of land. So you go for something like 150, 160 acres divided by almost 2,000. You see where it goes, right? And they all had interest in that land. How do you manage that? So, um, the thing is, at the end of the day, this impacts your wealth. Because there was no will that says, you know, I want the farm to go to this child and I'm going to give cash to this child. Or I want the farm to go to the, these two kids, and I'm going to send these two kids to college. <coughs> that land, a piece of land, has just been deep, 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 until, you know, you could almost hold it in your hand. And it's one thing about people who, when they find out they own land, right, they always think it's a thousand acres, and they always think it's a million dollars. All of us. Very few million dollar acres in Macon County. So, what, what about air property in Macon County, right? That's air property, that's Macon County's air property. And all those little purple pieces are air property. And you can find, you can go online, type in Macon County Revenue Commissioner's Office, Everson Gandy, the Revenue Commissioner. And then on the off, there's a little tab up there that says GIS map, and you hit the tab. And then it says go to map, and you hit that, and it says do you agree, blah, 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 you say yes. And then where it says owner's name, you hit type in air, and that pops up. 
And then you can click on every one of those things and you can find out who owns the land or who is paying the taxes on that land, where they live, what the taxes are, what the land is valued, and so on. So, if you take all these pieces of land, right? This is what it looks like. There are 1,138 parcels of land, but some people own more than one parcel. So, 903 acres. The land is about 12,000 acres in Macon County. Now, land value is, that's what, what, the, what the tax appraiser says the land is worth. It's worth $23.8 million. Now, improvement value means that something is on the land that improves its value. It could be a house, it could be fencing, it could be terracing, it could be all sorts of anything, a barn. $12 million for a total, add these two together, of almost $36 million. Okay? Now, again, one of the negative things about air property is because it's held in common, it can't be used as collateral to put a house on. Okay? Because the bank's not going to take a risk on something that a bunch of people own, but only one person is signing for, and they don't own the land. They are co-tenants with the land. I already mentioned about you know, harvesting timber, and also some USDA programs you can't participate because you have air property. Now, so, you say, well, how does it get here? It could be that there's a house on it to begin with. And therefore, it's, it's worth more than what it would be without the house. Now, if you go out to the, the western part of Alabama, that got hit pretty bad by Katrina. And there were a lot of old houses on that air property. When Katrina came through and knocked down a lot of those houses, but because it's air property, the owners couldn't get a mortgage to rebuild the houses. So what happened? They put trailers on them. So, so house to a trailer, because it's air property. Another thing is utilities. If you put utilities on your air property, you have to get everyone to sign for it. Another woman in Nickin County called me up and said that her son was a disabled vet, and she put a trailer on the family land so he could live out there. And she wanted to put in sewer and electricity. But a sister wouldn't approve it. So the utility said, can't do it. Because it's air problem. Okay. So anyway, this is the air property in, in Lincoln County. Um, and this shows you the value of that air property compared to property that has the owner has title to it. Okay? So that air property is about half the size of title property. Its value is 58% of title property. 40% in terms of improvement value, 40% of total value, and it pays only 57% of, of the taxes. Okay? That's another thing. Because you can't use air property to its full potential, that means that it then doesn't generate the same amount of income that shows up in taxes. And what do taxes go for? Those for your schools, your roads, your bridges, your safety, you know, the whole thing. So let's be a little closer, right? Because we're here, right? Paris Barrett. This is their property in Harris Barrett, dear Harris Barrett. Okay, so this is Harris Barrett, the little people, this little spot here. And this is about a two mile radius around the school. And another one of our PhD students is looking at their property, and what we're hypothesizing it might be like clusters of air property around the historically black schools and churches. 
because all the old churches had schools associated with them. Right? I mean, Harris Barrett, the school here is at St. John's. And then the one down the road, right? Right. Yeah, the one that this is Washington used to have meetings in. Right. Yeah. So the schools and the churches were together, which meant that there was a community here. So that there might be clusters of air property. And that's what we're seeing. You go to all the old schools and churches, and you see air property has popped up a lot. And there's one part of the county, there's their property, but no school or church. But I'm wondering if there used to be one. It's just not there anymore. So here's Harris Barrett, Harris Barrett. And then this is the air property that's around Harris Barrett. And if you look at it, 52 parcels, 43 owners, 757 acres of land, worth $1.7 million. $300,000, these are all houses. Okay, if you go into the liquor, excuse me, you'll see that they're houses. So the land is worth $2 million, the air property around Harris Barrett. And it pays about $8,000 in taxes. Okay? So there's surrounded by air property here. So, Land loss. Uh, two of the major areas of land loss are tax sales. You heard of tax sales? Yeah. You know your taxes are due in October. You come delinquent the 31st of December, and then you have your tax sale in April. And the, uh, again, Mr. Gandy, you know, selected, I think it's like a second or third Tuesday or something. And they have it downtown. And he says, the room that they have it is always full, standing room only. Okay. As a matter of fact, two of my students went and bought two pieces of land, but you know, they've got the tax deed. Right. So they auction the taxes to the highest bidder. You get a tax lien certificate, and if you pay those taxes for three years, guess what? You. you bought some land for the price of the taxes. Now, this is kind of your fallback. An owner can buy back the land or pay back the taxes, but <coughs> you have to pay the taxes plus 12%. And you wonder, why are people buying taxes? Who do you know, what do you know that pays 12% interest on your money? Right? Now, Mr. Gandy will tell you that at the tax sale, there are three big buyers. One from Lee County, Auburn. One from Macon County. One from Montgomery County. They're the ones with the deep pockets. They've done all the research. And they're looking for the best pieces of land. Okay. But there are a lot of other pieces of land out there for, for auction as well. And what they'll do, what people do, is they'll buy lots of little pieces. And then either they can um, they'll pay the taxes and then wait for the owners to then pay it back and they get their 12% interest. Or, at the end of the day, they can walk away. Because a lot of folks don't. They're not there for the land. They're there for the investment. Okay? They're there for the investment. Now, I don't know if all the revenue commissioners do this, but Mr. Gannon was saying that what he does is before he opens the, the meeting, you know, the, the auction, he will allow previous owners to come in and get the first stab at it. Do you want to buy back your land? And if there's a family member we get out and they have to check, you know, their checkbook and they say, okay, this is how much you owe, this is the 12% interest you owe, this is the service fee or whatever you go with that. But this is one way, again, that people lose their land. 
because they might have a relative nearby that's been paying the taxes, they pass on. Who's going to pay the taxes? Because the other heir is in Chicago or Detroit, right? Land comes up, no one pays the taxes. And the thing is, if no one buys it, it goes to the state. And what does the state want? The state does not want to own land. Because then it becomes a liability to them. The state wants to sell the land, because when they sell the land, then the next owner pays taxes. Right? The state wants money. They don't want land. So, if no one buys, you know, if no one pays the taxes, someone else can buy it. If no one else does it, the state will get it, then the state will sell it. Okay, then the last, not the last, but another way of losing land, <coughs> partition sales. Anyone hear of partition sales? Okay. Now, a partition sale occurs because an owner or a co-tenant of your property decides that they're tired of co-owning with it. They want their land. Okay? As and I gave the example of 100 acres and there's 10, you know, siblings. So they have 10%, but one of them says, I want my 10 acres. You know, this, this other thing doesn't do me any good. I want to put a house on it and I want to, you know, do this on, I want to hunt on it, and I don't want to have to ask everybody else. You know, I want mine. So, in a partition sale, let's see what we got here. Um, what happens is that the co-tenant goes to the judge and says, I want my 10%. And then the judge will then say, okay, Let's take a look, see how we can divide up your 10% or your 10 acres. Well, it's very rare that you have a nice piece of land that's all flat or all uniform and that they can carve out a chunk. Because, you know, this may have trees, this may have a creek, this may have a lake, this may have some wasteland, this may have the house, right? So how do you divide that so that everyone gets their 10% interest? So, if they cannot do that, then the judge says, no, there's no way I can divide this up. So what happens is the whole piece comes up for sale. They will auction off the whole 100 acres, and then that person gets 10% of the sale. Right. Now, the real risk is, again, you know, I said 10, but what if you had 100 heirs? You know, you have two generations of people. I showed the example of almost, after four generations, 2,000. Okay? For a piece of land. You know, how does a judge carve out two acres? Or half an acre? That's equitable to everybody. Now, the real crunch comes in that you can't sell your land if you're a co-tenant, but you can sell your interest. Okay? So, let's say you have half interest, or 1% interest. You live out in Chicago or LA or someplace, and it's a nice piece of land. It's near a lake, and people are like, wow, that's a nice piece of land. And somebody's gone through all the record books because it's online now. And they say, oh, look, because I showed you all the pieces of air property. They click on it. They look at it, get a nice picture of it. So, wow, well, it's 100 acres. I wonder how many heirs are on it. And some can look and check on that and say, wow, there's a lot of heirs on this. Hmm. And so, you find out the heirs, what their interest is. So you call up the heir in California. He says, you know, I see that he has some interest in some land in Macon County. Really? I don't remember that. I you know, that was my grandfather's land, and I've never been out there in California all my life. He says, well, 
Yeah, I, I live in Macon County, and I'll give you a thousand dollars for that piece of land. Thousand dollars? Did I say a thousand? No, I meant five thousand dollars for that piece of land. Oh, I can sell the land. Well, you're, not, you're selling me your interest, but yeah, they do all the paperwork, and now this person who has no relation to the family is bought into that land. So now they own that. 1% or 2 whatever that person had, now they have that interest. And now they say to the judge, I want my acres. The judge says, I can't, you know, I'm not Solomon, I can't divide this up. The whole thing comes up for sale, which is what the person wanted to begin with. They had the cash on hand, goes up for auction. You know, the family tried, they tried, they tried. Oh, we don't have any more cash. That guy's going, ding, ding, ding. Case closed, yours. Because they were able to buy into the family, get that interest. Now, recently, there's been some law called the Uniform Partition of Heirs Property Act. It started in, well, it started in 2010. And it offers a little bit of protection for heirs against partition sales. Okay. That is, the co-tenant has to notify all the other co-tenants. A lot of times this was done very quickly. Okay. And by co-tenant, it doesn't mean necessarily family, because I just showed you how a non-family member could get in there. But all the other co-tenants have to be notified that there's been a request for partition. Uh, the court has to order an independent appraisal. Okay, not just a friend of a friend who said, oh, that land is worth this, this amount of money. Because what they could do is appraise it at a higher value so that it gets all the heirs out of the way. That's the independent, independent appraisal. And Based on that appraisal, all the other co-tenants have the right of first refusal. That is, they can then buy the other person out. Based on the appraisal, not on an auction price, where that person can go higher and higher and higher. Okay? So, this is very, very, very important. And they have 45 days to come up with that. That is, we're going to do the, the partition in a week. Who can get money together, right? In a week. So, and then, um, if you don't have, uh, if, you, if you, the co-tenant elects not to purchase a share, they can uh, order a partition in kind. That means that the judge will try to actually do the actual acreage, and only when they can't do the acreage that, the, that then they will do the uh, partition sale. And if it goes to sale, it has to be on the open market at a price no lower than the value, of the appraised value of land. Um, these are the states that have enacted this. Interestingly, Alabama was one of the first that adopted it. So we've got a dozen states and the Virgin Islands. And we have, uh, these states are up right uh, this year, to, including D.C., to adopt this. Now it's not perfect, but it kind of slows the wheels down so that a family is not rushed. And they can look at all the other areas and say, do we want this to happen? And can we buy this person out so that the family can, can keep their land? Um, also, the uh, Farm Bill has some provisions that are still trying to work it out that says, basically, it's not everything, but those states that have adopted the air property law that I just told you about, if the co-tenants collectively account for 51% of the land, 
then the land can be used as collateral for farm programs. Okay? It doesn't stop them from being eligible for farm programs. If you can get, they say it's not quite fair that a person with 1% can stop the whole thing when everyone else wants to do something else. So if you can get up to 51%, get over that halfway mark, and you can do it. Now, of course, the best way to avoid air property, right, is state plan. And you know, I put down will. You can do a limited liability company or corporation or, or a couple other legal entities which you talk to a lawyer about. But this really, really, <laughs> this is the way to, to, to protect your land. I have a, a colleague on campus, and his mother and her sister, I think they own 100 acres in Greene County. Air property, just the two of them, no one else. <coughs> and my colleague's mother wanted to get her 50%, her 50 acres, because then she could will it to her son, whose son would have that 50 acres. And that sister would not do anything. You know, no matter what she tried. And they asked me, well, yeah, what can we do? I said, well, I mean, the bottom line is you can sue for a partition. You know, no one likes to sue your family. Well, some people may. But, I mean, basically she can stop it because she doesn't want to do it. But then I asked, you know, I kept asking, no, nothing's changed. And then I said, oh, you know, how's that air property? Well, my aunt died. And I said, well, that's good, I guess, because now you have everything. And she goes, she goes no. She has a son that's worse than she is. <laughs> so, you know. So anyway, you know, that's probably the only thing that she can do that is to sue for, for a partition and then get that 50%. But, um, it's tough. You know, I showed you the case of those 54 acres, how that could go back and forth. I showed you the case of the almost 2,000 acres. And that is really, I mean, it's like, and the first thing, you know, if you, if you ask me to come in and work with a family or something, so, I said, the first thing you have to do is do a family tree, okay? Who is related to who? List everybody, from the first person that had the land with the title, to all their kids, 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 and I mean all the kids, you know, even the other ones. Everyone down. Because what you'll see is depending on who dies when, you'll have you know jumps in generations. You'll have uncles here that are heirs, and their brothers and sisters may have passed, but then their nephews and nieces are heirs. And these are all the people you need to get together and say, what do we want to do? Okay? What do we want to do? So they can sign off and say, you know. I want to sell my interest. Okay. You know, they get money, you get land. Or you get bigger interest. Um, and you can set up, like this limited liability corporation, where you have an entity that will generate money, and then based on your interest, you get that money. But the land is protected. And so, you say, wow, this is going to be really hard. You know, you know what's worse than not doing it now? Doing it tomorrow. Or doing it the next day. I said, well, I'll let the kids sort it out. You're not doing your kids any favor. And they're going to say, why didn't they do this for me? Because now i got to deal with crazy Uncle Joe. Um, but, yeah, you know, it's just, it doesn't get any easier. It just gets harder and harder. And the best way, the best time is you start now, family reunions, right? When you got most of the people there, start filling in the blanks. What do you want to do? What do you want to do? This, that. Eventually it does get done. It does get done. That's it. So, I hope that, that maybe sparked a little bit of interest in what you need to do. Some of you may have this all signed, sealed, and delivered, which is, you know, that's great. 
and you need to help your friends or other relatives that are looking at it because, you know, land is important. You know, the people, you know, if you have land that's three generations long, you know, how hard was it for your great-grandparents to get that land? So that's a trust that they have given to you. And you can't afford to just let it go. The, the example I gave with the 2,000 heirs, the person was born in 1863. That means that most likely they were enslaved. But they went from that status to landowner status, and they kept that land. That is amazing. And do you want that land then to just poof? And we even carry it further. That person's mother was born in the 1820s. Alabama was five years old. The United States was less than 50 years old. And that person's mother was born in the 1790s. George Washington was still president. That may have been the person that came over. So that line has this huge history in this country, and then someone was finally able to buy land. So the best thing they could do is keep that name. And we all have those stories, right? We all have those. Whether you bought the land in the 1800s or 1900s or today, that's a stake that says this is important and I don't want it just to go, you know, poop. Somebody else gets it. You know, I want my kids to get it. And that way you just deed it off and say, protect it. Oh, hope that was good. Thank you very much. I want to thank Dr. Zavavo again for coming in and but this time, blame it on my mind and not my heart. I missed one of our esteemed members and the alumni, Mr. Louise Campbell. Wow. 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 And uh, if, I, if you took anything from this, it's get a will, stupid. <laughs> Get a will. If you got a will, this eliminates all of this. We always talk about the people who leave who create the situation. But then if you leave a will, the situation does not exist. So get the will. Take care of your properties. We're losing a lot of money because people don't have legal ownership of their own properties. So let's take care of that. Mr. Jack. Good afternoon. My name is Terrence Jackson. I'm the Regional Agriculture and Natural Resource Agent for Macon and Montgomery County. And I would like to thank the Harris Barrett School for allowing me to partner with y'all on this program. And I, I really, really, really want to uh, thank Dr. Z. Um, this journey has been a long journey for me personally uh, with my family and Harris property. Um, especially, I got started Dr. Z. I heard um, Jackson text me and said, um, I think Dr. Z is talking about your grandmother in class. <laughs> I had just took her down to uh, my family property that weekend and went to the grave site, showed her everything, and she's like, I really, really think that she's talking about your grandmother. Um, one point that stuck out was when I said, uh, yes, they spell my grandmother's names all type of ways. And then that was the thing that she said. So I seen Dr. Z at ARD, it's a conference um, that I had a presentation at. And I called him by the um, elevator. And I was like, hey, my name is Terrence Jackson or whatever. And um, he was like, hey, Mr. Jackson. And I was like, yeah, uh, I think you've been doing some research on my family. And I just want to you know, touch base on you about it. And then he was like, Jackson. Jackson? <laughs> a prairie form? I'm like, yes, that's my family. So uh, he told me all the research he's done on my family. And this kind of have been, ever since then, it's been the spark uh, for my family, not only to put their differences aside, but also to reach back in history and find out about our family. Um, I had a difficult time with my great-grandfather. Um, I grew up on a farm in East End, and he bought this farm for his entire family. He, I didn't want to do with agriculture. I didn't want to go into agriculture. My mom is laughing right now because she know for sure <laughs> that <laughs> I did not want to do it. But my great grandfather, he was like, "Why don't you try it anyway? It's something that you've done all your life. It's something that you know how to do." 
But when he passed away, I had a time like keeping in touch with it. So what I did, I started to reach back in time and see who are these people? Why, why am I here? Why do God want to be me to be in agriculture? And I started to find all the problems that was happening in agriculture and air property. And I feel like God placed me here to do my part and help our community fix some of these issues. So that's why I want to do the things that I do. That's why I'm committed to being a great essential agent in this community. I want everybody to sign the uh, sign-in sheet so I can get your um, mailing addresses, also your email addresses, so I can send you um, all the programming that I have going on in this county. Also, we have a survey going out, um, just saying how well was the presentation. If you all just take time out to uh, do that survey, I greatly appreciate it. Um, also, this is just the first um, program. This is my very first program um, since I started in April. And this is just the very beginning of this heir's property. One of, we want to turn it into a series. I talked to Dr. Um, Z about it a little bit about it. And I see how we can probably turn it into a series for you guys to get the most out of it. So I greatly appreciate you all coming. And uh, I can't wait. So well, Alfonso, what did we just experience there? Well, we got knowledge uh, today, uh, Brother Frazier. Uh, black landowners were losing property left and right. None paying taxes, not having wills, not knowing how to track down our, the owners when they leave from the area where we were born and raised from the family property. You know, it, it's just very informative. It, it just should be broadcasted. It should be held every week all over the county where they can have a meeting to discuss. It was very, very, very informative. I've learned, I know about real estate. I own uh, houses and property. I went to real estate school to uh, become a salesperson for real estate. But I learned some land. Land, that's the main issue. Black, we are losing our grand, great grandparents and grandparents' land because the family don't know how to come together. You know, we talk about this at our family reunion. I'm one of these uh, uh, overseers for the AP Boy State, myself and, and two of my cousins. And we, uh, we do all the property tax, we do whatever is necessary, and we give a report every two years when we have our family reunion. Let them know what the rental property is, uh, the other properties, and it's just very fun. I learned some things here today from my own personal about my children and, and grandchildren, but my own children. You have to have a will. The will nullify all kinds of problems when there's a lot of people involved in property. You get the will done. If you got sisters and instead of with my sisters and brother while we were living, get the will done. So if one dies, we have to go through the kids and then, then their kids if, it, if they're that old. You know what I'm saying? You get that will done now and have it notarized, signed and notarized and you move on from there. Then when they die, the will will tell you exactly what they wish, their wishes were when they were living. For their, for their offspring. So uh, it was very informative. I, uh, I think uh, 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 the, the university for sending out a representative to uh, talk to us about this. And uh, we all, we owe all of the credit, 99% of the credit goes to the president of Harrisburg School, which is Brother Grover Fountain. He put this all together and, and, and got this set up. And I think uh, Grover, president of Harrisburg School, I'm the treasurer for the organization. Well, Grover is the president, and he uh, he's very uh, knowledgeable about things, and he sees things that need to be done in the community to, to help us, to help uh, our people, to become more knowledgeable of uh, how to deal with uh, property and land and real estate. Uh, so uh, that's that's my program. That's that's my thought. Okay. And I thank uh, brother, thank you, brother Frazier, for coming to so you can air this uh, and move it on to another level. Thank you, sir. I appreciate you, you very coming. much. Yes, sir.